David, the man after God's own heart and the king of Israel anointed by God, is on the run. Not for any crimes he's committed. In fact, he has never been accused of committing a crime. He's not fleeing because he's committed a moral blunder or injured someone. He is on the run because of the insane jealousy of King Saul. Saul was Israel's king, but he had already disqualified himself and been rejected by God. God had already anointed David and infused him with the Holy Spirit, and he was being groomed to be Israel's future king. David is on the verge of collapsing, and he is terrified. David is able to flee Gath's prison and travel to Abdullam's cave thanks to a miracle. The cave of Abdullam is only around 10 kilometers from David's hometown of Bethlehem. It's in the Valley of Elah, not far from where David defeated Goliath. David flees Gath for the cave of Abdullam, where God will do something in his life that will forever affect the course of his life. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Abdullam, and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. This was David's lowest point to date, and if you want to know how he truly felt, read Psalm 142, the song he wrote about it. He had nothing, no security, no food, no one to talk to, no promise to hold on to, and no hope that anything would ever change. He was trapped in a dark cave, cut off from everything and everyone he cared about, everyone except God. It's no surprise that he wrote this dreadful lament. Psalms chapter 142, verses one through seven. I cry to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord do I make supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed and fainted, throwing all its weight upon me, you then knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a snare for me. Look on the right hand, the point of attack, and see. For there is no man who knows me to appear for me. Refuge has failed me, and I have no way to flee. No man cares for my life or my welfare. I cried to you, O Lord. I said, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my loud cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my life out of prison, that I may confess, praise, and give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me and crown themselves because of me, for you will deal bountifully with me. That was David's experience as a cave dweller. I don't know of a soul on earth who cares for my soul. I am brought very low. Deliver me, Lord. Can you feel the loneliness of that gloomy place? The dampness of that cave? Can you feel David's pain? The depths to which his life has deteriorated? There is no escape. There is nothing left. Nothing. Yet in the thick of all this, David has not lost sight of God. He cries out for the Lord to rescue him. Despite all this, David does not lose his sight of God. He pleads with the Lord to save him. And it is here that we see the man's true heart, that hidden characteristic that only God can perceive, that unseen trait that God saw when he chose and anointed the young shepherd child from Bethlehem. David has arrived at a point where God can actually begin to mold and use him. When the sovereign God brings us to naught, it is to redirect our lives rather than put an end to them. Aha, you've lost this, you've lost that, says the human perspective. Some may say, you're the one who started it all, You've wrecked this. God, on the other hand, responds, no. No, you entered the cave. That isn't easy to say it's all over. That suggests it's time to make some changes in your life. It's time to start all over. He does the same thing with David. David does not display any advertisements, except to God. He's trapped in a cave by himself. And take a look at what God accomplished. Look who joined him. When his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, David's escape from the cave, they went down there to him, 22-1. Remember, it hasn't been long since David's family hasn't shown any interest in him. When Samuel came to the house looking for a prospective kingship contender, his own father had practically forgotten about him. Are these all your sons? Samuel had to ask. Oh, no, Jesse responded, snapping his fingers. I've got a son who keeps the sheep. Later, when David arrived to the battle and was about to take up weapons against Goliath, his brother sat him down and said, we know why you're really here. You just want to be seen. But in this place, he's broken, without crutches, crushed in spirit. Would you take a look at who comes to him? Those same brothers, as well as his father and the rest of his family. When you're in the cave, you don't always want other people there. You can't always bear being among others. You despise admitting it in public. 
In fact, you almost never do. However, it's true. Sometimes all you want to do is be alone. And I have a hunch that this cave dweller, David, didn't want anyone around at that time in his life. Because if he didn't think he was worth anything to himself, he didn't think he was worth anything to anyone else. David didn't want his family, but they came. He didn't want them there, but God insisted on bringing them. With him, they crawled inside the cave. But have a look, they weren't the only ones. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. What a group! Everyone who was in need showed up. The Hebrew word zuk here implies under pressure, under stress, as well as under distress. So here came hundreds of pressured people. Secondly, everyone who was in debt flocked to the location. Hebrew here, nasha, means to lend on interest, to have a number of creditors. As a result, there were people who couldn't afford to pay their bills. Finally, there was everyone who was discontented. The Hebrew here, mara nefesh, means to be in bitterness of soul, to have been wronged and mistreated. That group came too. So what does it all mean? Well, the land was aching under Saul's authority at the time. He'd put the people under too much strain. He had treated them terribly. He was a madman who suffered from severe depression, and they were paying the price. Some could no longer take it. As a result, David ended up with a cave full of disgruntled people. Can you believe it? It's awful enough that you're alone in there feeling like a worm, but having almost 400 more worms crawl in with you is a disaster. However, God is at work in this situation. David's life is being rerouted by him. The man is in the cave. He does, after all, believe he is worthless. He believes he is useless. He believes he has been treated unfairly. He feels misunderstood. That's why he's hiding out in the cave. And before he can spit, his brothers come. A lot of people only remember his brothers for the tough remarks. However, his entire family comes to him at this low point. As a matter of fact, strangers of all kinds begin to pour in before he can find them a seat. I'm not sure how word got around, but he soon had 400 other cave dwellers looking to him as their leader. That cave was no longer David's escape hatch. This place, the stinky, dark cave, was used as a training ground for individuals who would later become known as David's Mighty Men of Valor. That's right, this motley bunch would become his mighty warriors in combat, and when he got office, they'd become his cabinet. He changed their lives by instilling order, discipline, character, and direction in them. David had been beaten to the point where he couldn't see anything but up. And when he glanced up, God was there, gradually introducing this group of strangers to him until they proved themselves to be the most powerful men in Israel. Wow, what a pivotal moment in David's life when he made the decision not to walk away. He'd accept his situation and try to make the best of it. So what if it was a cave? If those around him needed leadership, he'd provide it. Who'd have believed the next king of Israel would be training his men in a dark cave where no one could see them and no one cared? What an unusual thing for God to do. The rough Judean wilderness, with its rocks, caverns, and deep wadis, was his Sherwood forest. Because God wanted him to be a maverick king, he commanded a bunch of mavericks there. There would never be another king like David in Israel. Let's take a look at two more of David's works, Psalms 57 and 34. We don't know in what sequence he composed these, but based on his life, they appear to be written in this order. Psalm 142, when he was on his face, Psalm 57, when he was on his knees, and Psalm 34, when he was on his feet. Notice that Psalm 57 is titled, A Mictham of David. When he fled from Saul in the cave, the descriptive line at the beginning of many of the Psalms gives you their author and their context. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. Psalm 57, one through three. At this point, David is on his knees. He's still down, 
but at least he's looking up. He's no longer just looking within. Then he says, I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Psalm 57, 4. They are a thankless, coarse, and thoughtless body of people, so overwhelmed with their own needs they don't pay attention to anyone else's. Later on, we discover that David's warriors mastered the sword as well as the bow and arrow. Obviously, they had some sort of training regimen in place. They figured out how to put on a show in battle. In the ranks, they built discipline. They may have started out as rebels, but they're on their way to becoming skilled hunters and brave combatants. From a cave of discontent, David and his outcasts developed themselves to the mighty men of David. The term Cave of Abdullam has been used by political commentators referring to any small group removed from power but planning to return. The details of these men are located in the book of Samuel and Chronicles, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8-12. through 12. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb Bashebeth, the Takamanite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eliezer the son of Dodo, the Ahahite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hirarite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. What caused such a significant shift in David's life and attitude? First, David heard enough to admit his need. When you're in pain, you need to tell someone about it, especially the Lord. David was in enough pain to confess he needed help. Second, he was brave enough to cry out for assistance. Our generation has lived under such a veil for so long that we don't know how to scream for aid. God, on the other hand, values such vulnerability. He did back then, and he still does now. Finally, he was humble enough to listen to God. What a tragedy that humans can live in cave after cave without ever learning from God. David, not at all. We can admire the man's modesty if we are in a cave. Some of us are trapped in an emotional cave that is dark, bleak, damp, and depressing. Perhaps the most difficult aspect is that we are unable to tell anyone the truth because it is so desperate, so lonely. You'll need a shelter, a person who listens, someone who is aware of the situation. You'll need to hide in a cave. But who do you turn to when you don't have anyone to confide in? Where do you get your motivation? David was one of these people, and he turned to the living God for rest and restoration. He wrote these words in his laments journal when he was cornered, bruised by hardship, and fighting with discouragement and despair. In thee, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Psalm chapter 31, verse 1. Men have fallen from God. An example of such is Saul. To watch the fall of Saul, watch this.